Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the Security Senior Group Kannada Talk. Uh, today we have Srijita with us to talk on composably secure device independent encryption with certified deletion. Uh, um, maybe Srijita, do you want to proceed from here on? Yeah. Oh, I forgot to change the date. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, so I'm giving a talk on uh, the topic Nirish mentioned and. Uh, this is joint work with um, Ernest from the Zurich. Okay, so uh, this is um, a new sort of um, cryptographic task that we consider. So this is um, in some sort of um, scenario like this. Uh, so suppose, uh, so we have two parties, Alice and Bob. Um, so suppose at some time uh, T1, Alice uh, sends some message M that is encrypted with a secret key uh, to Bob. At some later time, say T2, um, the secret key will be uh, revealed to Bob and then he can um, use the secret key to decrypt the message. Um, okay, but now suppose before, uh, after the encrypted message has been sent, but before the key has been revealed, Alice um, decides that uh, she doesn't like Bob or something and she doesn't want him to learn the message. Um, we might want to do something like this. Alice might want Bob to delete the ciphertext. So she um, tells Bob to delete the ciphertext. And um, so our task will be something like, so uh, we want to encrypt the message in some such a way such that if Alice asks Bob to do this, Bob can send some sort of deletion certificate. And Alice can either accept or reject the deletion certificate. Um, now, and we want to say that if Alice accepts Bob's deletion certificate, then even when the secret key is revealed to Bob, he cannot uh, decrypt the message. We are assuming that we cannot prevent the secret key from uh, leaking to Bob in, that, in this case. I mean, uh, we're not concerned about why at this point. Maybe it was part of some larger protocol where the secret key was supposed to be revealed anyway, or I don't know, we, we don't care. Uh, so Alice cannot necessarily prevent uh, Bob from learning the message, uh, Bob can just send an invalid deletion certificate if he wants. But if Bob sends a valid deletion certificate and Alice accepts it, then we want that Bob shouldn't be able to learn the message when the key is revealed. Uh, so this task was um, revealed, um, introduced by uh, Broadbent and Slum in uh, 2019. So, and they gave uh, proper security definition and stuff for it. Um, but the protocol that they gave for it um, I mean, they show that this task, task can be achieved, uh, but it was in the uh, standard or um, device independent model. So uh, our contributions is that um, we um, modified the VR90 protocol, that we gave an entirely new protocol such that it's um, device independent, that is um, the states and measurements used in the protocol don't have to be trusted. And we also um, have an extra feature that uh, so in the task that the, the way I described the task uh, before, uh, security against a third party was not considered. We also provide security against a potential third party extractor. And um, uh, the security definition we use is also composable, which is an operational type of security definition. So it's, it's different from um, uh, the government and Islam security definition, but it's uh, stronger in a sense and ours and vice versa. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so in order to do that, um, yeah, it, uh, the existing DI proof techniques for this sort of things, uh, which are based on um, <clears throat> sequential um, sorts of settings, which I'll explain later, uh, uh, those were sort of insufficient. Uh, so we need to prove a sort of a parallel security. Uh, we need to prove parallel security in this case. Uh, and uh, that's based on a new sort of parallel repetition theorem we proof for um, uh, non-local games with uh, multiple input and output runs. <clears throat> okay, so okay, so let me describe what the standard or device dependent setting is. So an example of this is the uh, VA19 protocol, which can be either, um, so th these can be either like prepare and measure type scenarios where the honest party, in this case, this is going to be Alice, so she either uh, knows the states she prepares, but the measurements might be untrusted, um, or they can be entangled mist where the measurements are untrusted. Uh, sorry, the measurements are trusted, but the states are known. 
or both can be trusted, for example, um, in more uh, limited sorts of protocols. Um, now, for device independence, we want to ask whether we can weaken these assumptions. Now, in the device independence setting, what we have is that we assume that the devices that the parties use are some sorts of black boxes. So there's states and measurements are both unknown. Uh, their devices are something in which they can um, enter some inputs, uh, say Alice enters input X and Bob enters input Y in this case and get some outputs. <clears throat> uh, so uh, an example of um, such device independent um, black boxes, for example, would be um, black boxes which are compatible with this uh, thing called the magic square game that we use. So in the magic square game, Alice and Bob uh, get inputs which are um, <clears throat> Uh, which are uh, basically uh, traits, and they have to give inputs which are uh, three uh, three bit strings, and uh, they satisfy a, a certain parity condition, and they win if uh, Alice's this ay equal to bx condition is satisfied. Okay, uh, I have indexed them differently here. Now, for uh, device independence, we use this certain property called uh, rigidity or self-testing, either indirectly or directly we use this property that, uh, so for example, for in the, in, the, in the magic square game, if we can show that these um, devices, uh, whatever they were, uh, uh, we didn't make any assumptions about what the states were, um, measurements they were performing. If, but, but regardless of that, if the devices win the magic square uh, game with uh, probability close to one, then the, the states and measurements Alice and Bob used. So the states that they shared should have been uh, uh, two uh, maximally entangled states and they were performing uh, for the measurements. Okay, so uh, the magic square uh, game uh, has been used to uh, do a device independent uh, QKD before. We will sort of use the device independent QKD protocol based on magic square in our protocol. So <clears throat> let me describe that. So uh, in this case, uh, for so for QKD, Alice and Bob want to share a long secret key, right? So if um, they want to do this based on the magic square game, since the magic square game only gives three bits of output, um, they need to share uh, boxes, uh, several boxes playing uh, the magic square game. So say they want to generate an uh, L-bit um, raw key, they will share boxes which they like L copies of the magic square game. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, we have L boxes here. Uh, Alice shares boxes one through L, Bob has boxes one through L. Um, and yeah, they're entangled in some complicated way. They don't necessarily have to be brought up with each other or something. And Alice enters some uh, X, X1 to XL as an inputs, Bob enters Y1 to YL as his inputs, and they get these outputs A1 to L and B1 to BL. <coughs> Okay, um, so in this protocol, they will do this. Uh, they will share the boxes and uh, use uh, private randomness to uh, select their inputs. And uh, uh, for DIQPD, private randomness is unlimited, so they can do that. Um, and then at the end, uh, after getting their outputs, uh, Alice will select some random subset of the um, uh, or subset of one through L some uh, very small subset so that revealing it does not make any difference. And um, so Alice will communicate all her inputs to Bob and the outputs corresponding uh, to the subset. And Bob will uh, correspond all his inputs to Alice and his outputs corresponding to uh, the subset. Uh, okay. And then uh, they will both test whether the magic square winning condition is satisfied for their inputs and outputs on this subset. If it's not satisfied, then uh, they will abort the protocol. But if they if there is no abort, as if the test passes, then uh, remember that uh, in the magic square game, um, Alice and Bob uh, have a common bit. So for each uh, uh, i equal to one through L, Alice and Bob will pick that common bit as their uh, shared raw key. Um, now for the final key, uh, we need to do some privacy amplification on the raw key uh, okay. 
uh, for this, uh, this is something called the leftover hashing lemma we use and the, the uh, quantity of interest there is um, the, the mean entropy of uh, the raw key uh, condition on some third party Stroker's uh, quantum system and, um, and Alice and Bob's inputs x, y, which have been uh, revealed to the eavesdropper because um, uh, uh, recall that they have communicated these x, y things and that's all, we assume that's over a public channel. Okay, and uh, uh, so the operational interpretation of this quantity, the min entropy of uh, k given uh, is uh, this e tilde system uh, uh, is equal to the log of the guessing priority of uh, given everything she has. So by this e tilde system, what do I mean? So, okay, so let me model Alice and Bob's L boxes as two big boxes now. So uh, they have these two boxes where they enter inputs and get outputs from, but, and we assume that they uh, have some entangled state. Ideally, they share entanglement only with each other and with nobody else. But um, in reality, they could be sharing a joint entangled state uh, with um, the eavesdropper E. So this we'll call uh, e, e tilde, Eve's quantum system we will call E tilde. This is, um, yeah, another box. And uh, Eve has access to Alice and Bob's uh, inputs um, and she can enter that into her box. So we can uh, treat that as her uh, classical input sort of, uh, because Alice and Bob's inputs have been communicated over a classical channel. Okay. Now, uh, so let me discuss uh, how a parallel security proof for this is done. So um, by parallel security, I mean that we don't make assumptions about how Alice and Bob entered their, uh, uh, entered their uh, inputs into their boxes. Uh, most of the QKD, uh, DI secured, uh, QKD security proofs are in this sequential sort of setting where we assume, have to assume that Alice and Bob um, <clears throat> enter each xi, um, yi into the boxes one by one and then get their respective inputs and we have to make some assumptions about how the outputs can depend on the inputs from previous rounds or later rounds, etc. I mean, so the outputs cannot depend on inputs from later rounds, uh, for example, but um, uh, inputs which are entered later, when I say round, I mean that in this context. <coughs> okay. Uh, so uh, instead, um, the protocol uh, given by um, uh, the JMS20 protocol, which I just described, JMS is Jane Miller, Miller and she, which I probably forgot to mention. Uh, so the parallel security proof uh, was given by them and it was subsequently simplified by uh, Vidic. I will uh, discuss uh, Vidic security proof. So Vidic security proof, um, goes via a parallel repetition theorem. So the parallel repetition theorem is for a, a three player game that is between Alice, Bob and Eve. Uh, so in the three player game, Alice and Bob uh, receive, I mean, on Alice and Bob's side, it's just like magic square. Alice and Bob receive inputs X and Y. Uh, uh, so this is a simplified version in order to prove the parallel repetition theorem. Uh, we need to do a sort of transformation on this game called uh, anchoring. Yeah. So Alice and Bob uh, receive X and Y just like in Magic Square, and Eve receives um, both Alice and Bob's inputs X Y. And um, the winning condition of the game is Alice and Bob have to uh, win the normal Magic Square game, and Eve has to produce one bit of output which uh, which is equal to their common bit. So Eve has to guess their common bit. Uh, and uh, it can be shown that uh, the winning priority of this three-player version of this of the Magic Square game it's uh, less than one sort of follows from such testing properties, I guess. Um, now, um, in the, um, so uh, with some uh, thought, it can be um, seen that um, Eve's, uh, the priority that uh, in the in the magic square based uh, QKD protocol, the priority that Eve guesses K and there is no abort um, uh, because the abort condition uh, depends on Alice and Bob winning uh, the Magic Square game on their side. Uh, so the priority of this event is the priority that Alice, Bob and Eve win this, uh, win 
L parallel copies of this game, um, MSC. And um, by a, a, a parallel repetition theorem for anchored games, we can show that this uh, priority is exponentially small in K. So Eve's guessing priority uh, for um, K and hence the Eve's guessing priority in uh, for K, uh, it, it depends on the abort condition, uh, abort priority, which is fine. That's supposed to depend on the abort priorities anyway. So this is um, this is exponentially small k. Uh, so the corresponding uh, uh, min entropy that we get is going to be linear in L, and then we can do privacy amplification in it, and to be fine, we get a uh, big T out of it. Okay. Now we want to use this um, DIQKD protocol for our uh, DI um, ECD protocol. So for uh, DI ECD, uh, what we're going to do is uh, since, uh, so in DIQQD, Alice and Bob chose uh, X, X1 to XL and Y1 to YL uh, privately by themselves using private randomness. Here, since only Alice is the honest party, we are going to let Alice choose both X1 to XL and Y1 to YL by herself. And then uh, Alice and Bob will do the DIQQD protocol, except um, Bob will not necessarily enter the input, all the inputs on his side um, at the beginning. Uh, he will <clears throat> he will just enter enough inputs to do the uh, test thing that uh, he's supposed to do. But when he gets all of the inputs, he can um, get the secret key. Now, then Alice's ciphertext is going to be um, the message M that she wants to send. Uh, this is going to be uh, XORed with the final key that she gets from the DIQKD protocol. The final key, remember, is the privacy amplified version of the raw key, which is the output of the um, Magic Square games. And the decryption key is going to be uh, the inputs uh, X1 to XL and Y1 to YL that um, Bob used. Now, uh, because this is based on um, DIQKD, this uh, provides uh, security against a third party eavesdropper if, um, uh, even if the ciphertext is not deleted. So as, an, as, as I mentioned, Alice can or cannot, uh, Alice may or may not uh, want Bob to delete the ciphertext. So in our scenario, if she doesn't want Bob to delete the ciphertext, then uh, even when the key is revealed and Bob hasn't deleted the ciphertext, the ciphertext, the message is um, sec secured against the third party. Uh, this is not a property that uh, the uh, Broadbent and Islam protocol had, for example. Okay, now what we also need is that um, we want to want Bob to produce a deletion certificate in such a way that if Bob produces the correct, correct deletion certificate, then that erases the Rocky um, K. Uh, so if we erase the Rocky K, that also erases the final key. And because we've um, XOR the message with um, the final key. Uh, if uh, Bob does not know the final key, then Bob does not know uh, the message either. Okay. Um, so in order to do this major thing, we're uh, going to do uh, consider a two-player um, two-round uh, game, uh, so to speak, uh, which I'll call uh, MSB. Uh, by two round game, I mean that Alice, Alice and Bob have, um, you see, Alice and Bob can share some entangled state, then they uh, they receive some inputs, they give some outputs, and then one or both parties can receive another round of inputs and they give outputs again. Okay, so in this game, in the first round, Alice and Bob will uh, play the magic square game with inputs uh, x, y, prime sign, uh, which are distributed normally according to the normal uh, magic square distribution. Uh, then uh, in in the second round, Bob will receive another input uh, y, and uh, Bob's winning condition is that he has to uh, uh, guess Alice's output a y for a different uh, bit y as an, uh, a a different location uh, y that is different from y prime. Now uh, the point is in the magic square game. If Bob um, wins the first round, uh, does the correct um, uh, magic square measurement in the first round, then he can only learn the shared bit uh, that he has with Alice in the first round, which is um, 
um, AY prime, we cannot learn uh, AY. So, uh, so based on this, uh, so based on this property uh, and uh, self-testing basically, uh, Hu and Miller uh, proved that suppose the probability of uh, winning the first round is say close to one, then the probability of um, winning the second round is um, barely more than half as in so Bob might as well, Bob can't do anything better than guess in the uh, second round. So this means that the uh, winning pro overall winning priority, uh, the quantum winning priority of this MSB game is uh, less than one. And yeah, also overall for this um, MSB game, they're going to consider um, an anchored version later when we actually use this. Okay, now, so how do we uh, use this uh, property of the MSB game? So as I said, uh, Alison, Alice is going to uh, choose the x x1 to x uh, l and uh, y1 to yl uh, inputs herself. So she's going to use x1 to xl and y1 to yl to actually um, for her actual key. But she's also going to uh, uh, choose uh, y1 prime to y y uh, sorry y prime one to y prime l, such that each y is different from uh, each uh, y prime i. And uh, these uh, Y prime eyes are going to be used when she needs uh, Bob to delete the uh, ciphertext. So if Alice wants Bob to delete the ciphertext, she sends the Y primes to Bob. And uh, and ideally, uh, Bob does the measurements corresponding to Y prime to Alice. And he sends the uh, B primes that he gets back to Alice. And then uh, Alice checks if the magic square game winning condition for uh, inputs X and Y prime is satisfied. So uh, remember that's the winning condition for the first round of the uh, MSP game. <clears throat> and we have uh, seen that if the first round winning condition is satisfied with high priority, the second round winning can condition cannot be satisfied with high priority. So yeah, Alice checks if the winning condition of the magic square game with the uh, with inputs X and Y prime uh, is satisfied and uh, she accepts it, that is the case. And uh, we can show that after the, the, the inputs X and Y have been revealed to Bob. Uh, so when asked, Alice asks for the deletion certificate, only the Y primes are revealed and the X and Y are part of the, the decryption key which are revealed later to Bob. And we can show that when X and Y are revealed to Bob, then um, the probability that Bob guesses uh, okay, and Alice accepts his deletion certificate is exactly equal to the priority of um, uh, winning L parallel copies of the MSB game. Okay, and uh, our main result is that we show that this priority is uh, exponentially small in K as well, uh, L as well. Um, yeah, and this is done by a parallel repetition theorem. Okay, and the parallel repetition theorem is um, for a general type of game like this. So as I said, Alice and Bob are going to share some entangled state uh, and then their first round inputs are going to be X and uh, Y prime, uh, which are from a product distribution. So uh, this type of game we are going to call uh, a two round product anchor game. So product anchor because the first round inputs are from a product distribution like this. And the first round inputs are anchored uh, in the uh, anchored, uh, which is something I mentioned in my earlier talk uh, with respect to the uh, first round, uh, to, with respect to the second round input. Okay, so Alison, uh, so this class of game um, covers the MSP game as well, the anchored version of the MSP game, it is. Uh, so Alison, Bob, uh, so they're going to uh, share an entangled state and then receive first round inputs, as I said, and uh, they, they're going to produce their first, first round outputs A and B prime via measurements that depend on X and Y prime as a standard in non-local games on their respective halves of the entangled state. Then the second round, only Bob is going to uh, receive an input uh, Z. So uh, we have, so the anchoring property is that uh, Z is going to be equal to some um, anchored value, which we call perf here with some constant probability alpha. And uh, if uh, Z is equal to um, perp, then the 
the conditional distribution of x and y prime with the first round inputs uh, condition on uh, per is equal to the marginal distribution of uh, of x and y prime. Uh, and if uh, z is in first, then z is equal to uh, x y, where x is equal to Alice's first round input, and uh, y is distributed to her other. So um, yeah, it's so an anchored version of the uh, MSP game falls into this category, where uh, uh, because um, in the second round, uh, Bob receives uh, x and y as his inputs, uh, where x is equal to Alice's first round input, and um, the perk in this case uh, will just correspond to um, not giving Bob any, um, not giving Bob any input at all. So, which is something we can just do by not selecting some some of the boxes for uh, for use in the protocol. And yeah, so um, after receiving his second round uh, input, uh, Bob will produce some output B. So this output will be produced from the post measurement uh, state that Bob had. Uh, after the first round's measurement. Uh, and this measurement can depend on uh, Bob's first round output, Y prime, Bob's, uh, sorry, Bob's first round input, Y prime, Bob's second round input, uh, Z. And it can also depend on uh, uh, Bob's first round input, um, B prime that he had, because uh, he has this information and he can always use it. And the winning condition of the game is like two separate winning conditions. Uh, so, they have to win uh, some condition of the first uh, two rounds, uh, the first round, a which some uh, which is uh, a b prime x y prime some some predicate on this we don't care, and for the second round out output it's some predicate that depends on all the inputs and outputs. Okay, and the theorem that we prove is that uh, yeah the winning probability of um, L pal copies of this game is. Uh, yeah, this quantity, uh, if the winning quality of one round is omega, then the winning quality of L parallel rounds is one minus one minus omega to the pi by this quantity that goes down uh, exponentially in L. Okay. Um, so in order to prove this, we use a sort of um, standard information theoretic framework that's used for value replication theorems. Um, I've talked about this in a previous um, talk, so I won't go into too much detail, but the strategy is something like this. Uh, and so this was um, basically introduced by the class and a lot further by Hollenstein, etc. And it's used for a lot of um, parallel repetition proofs. So you consider uh, any given strategy for uh, G to the L. <clears throat> and you consider a subset C of L. And you show that uh, uh, one of these properties holds. So either the winning probability on C is already as small as you want, or um, condition on uh, condition on winning in C, you can find a coordinate i that is not in C where the winning probability is uh, small enough. So by induction, you can build up a large enough uh, subset um, to where the winning probability is small. And um, yeah, the second point is uh, proved. Uh, by like contradiction. So we show that if neither of these properties hold, then we can construct a, a strategy for a single copy of G, which has winning probability uh, greater than the single uh, the single round winning probability of G should be. Uh, so generally this is uh, done considering some state which represents um, the strategy uh, of the protocol. So in this case, and it's a two round game, uh, we consider a, a joint state of Alice and Bob with their inputs and outputs and all the entanglement that they share. Uh, so this is a superposition state over Alice and Bob's. Uh, so this is the state after both rounds of measurements. So this is a superposition state over Alice and Bob's. Uh, all the input states, all the output, uh, all the input registers and all the output registers. Uh, uh, when I write x, y, etc., here I mean all of x1 to xl, y1 to yl, etc. Uh, and um, because it's a two round game where the a, a, b prime registers are 
um, produced only from the first round inputs, uh, uh, X and Y, uh, sorry, X and Y prime. Uh, there, the distribution and the AB prime registers is um, independent of uh, Z given X and Y prime. Okay. So the state we are going to call uh, psi and uh, we can condition psi on uh, this event of the mean C, which we call um, E. So this gives us a, a state phi there. This is going to be useful. Uh, and um, so what we are going to call uh, phi x y prime, uh, x i y prime i z i is a state you get um, by um, measuring the x i y prime i and z i registers on uh, on phi, which are in superposition, uh, and getting output small x i small y prime i uh, small z i. And then on this uh, this state phi x i y prime i z i, if you measure the uh, a i b prime i b i registers, then you get some kind of uh, you get a conditional distribution, uh, and this is in fact equal to the the conditional uh, output distribution that you get from the strategy uh, uh, used in the game, condition on the the event that uh, you win. Um, in C. Okay, now uh, our so remember I said that our strategy, uh, our proof technique is going to be by contradiction. We are going to construct a single round um, strategy for G, a uh, condition, uh, a single round strategy for G such that its winning probability is going to be high. So the strategy will uh, the strategy will go like this. So in the first round, we only need to produce the correct. Uh, AI, uh, BI, uh, distri AI B prime I distribution. So this is going to be uh, produced uh, from the state uh, phi uh, xi uh, y prime i and uh, zi being equal to four. So this is because uh, uh, recall I said here that the distribution of uh, A, B and in, in particular A prime I, B prime I is independent of uh, Z given uh, X and Y prime. Uh, this is true in uh, psi. It's also so true in uh, phi because um, phi is not too far. At least in the coordinate high, phi is not uh, too far uh, from from psi uh, because we've conditioned on a small probability event. <clears throat> Sorry, we've conditioned on a large probability event. So, uh, okay. So. The distribution uh, a, a i b i b prime i um, condition on e x i y prime i and z i for any z i is equal to the um, distribution of a i b prime i condition on e and x i y prime i when z i is equal to uh, four. So, uh, so what we can do is in order to produce this um, something close to uh, this distribution that we want in the first round, Allison Bob. Um, can instead of producing the full state xi uh, phi xi y prime i zi, Allison Bob can produce uh, the state x, uh, phi xi y prime i for this. They can do by uh, sharing the state uh, just phi uh, for where the zi is um, equal to for, but xi y are still in zero position. Uh, and then they can do some local unitaries. Uh, how, what local unitaries they do? This is basically equivalent to a single round product called parallel repetition theorem. Um, the, it's some kind of Ullmann unitary that you get. It's the same technique um, that is used for a single round product parallel repetition uh, that was done by uh, Jane Perez, Lenny, and Yao. Uh, okay. And then second round, we need to produce the correct distribution of um, bi conditioned on uh, e and the first round inputs the first round input second round input as well as the first round outputs that we have produced uh, so in order to do this so the post uh, after the local operations um, the the state in the first round is uh, xi y prime i fork and uh, bob needs to produce uh, xi by prime i uh, zi for his uh, given input zi in the second round. Uh, so in order to do, the, do this, <clears throat> we 
will observe that um, Alice's uh, registers and uh, B prime I, uh, Alice's registers and the whole of B prime actually are close um, in X, uh, phi xi y prime i zi and xi y prime i uh, for because in the original state, the original unconditional state, uh, these things are not affected by um, uh, Bob's second round unitary at all. So using this property, we can um, find some new one unitary uh, that Bob can do on his side uh, in order to uh, produce, uh, uh, basically take the Bob state to the ZI state. Uh, but the problem is that this Ullman unitary uh, depends on all of xi, y prime i, and zi, and Bob does not necessarily have x prime y. But the way we define zi is uh, so either zi is perp, in which case Bob already has the state state that he wants and he has nothing to do, or uh, remember that we said uh, in in the other case zi contains xi, so zi is equal to some xi uh, yi. Okay. So the overall uh, strategy for the single round game is going to look like this. Alice and Bob are going to uh, share the state um, phi uh, per. Then in the first round, they receive their inputs x i y i. Uh, then they perform local unitaries u x i v y to get to the state uh, u x i y i per. And then the second round, Bob receives c i and he performs uh, this unitary w y i z i. They uh, get uh, the state uh, xi y i z i, and yeah, they perform some measurements in the first round uh, because, and yeah, I've already argued that the overall distribution that they're going to uh, get by the strategies close to the distribution that they want. Okay. Now, uh, so I mentioned that um, we prove uh, composable uh, security. What do I mean by that? So um, we use this um, framework called um, abstract cryptography. Um, it was sort of introduced by um, um, Moyer and Renner. It uh, existed in other forms, I guess. Um, so in the abstract cryptography framework, um, uh, we define a sort of ideal functionality for any cryptographic task that we want to do. And uh, the, the goal here is to show that so uh, uh, an abstract, uh, a composable security proof in this framework will go like this. We, sh we want to show that a real protocol that we use for any task can safely replace the ideal functionality. In the sense that if we want to use the ideal functionality in some bigger task, instead we can um, use the, uh, the actual protocol for the task. And that's safe. I mean, that doesn't mess up any of the security definitions or anything for the bigger task. Um, the, and how, how do we do this? We sort of prove that uh, the real and ideal functionality are indistinguishable. Um, I will explain um, what sort of means in a bit. The advantage of uh, this um, framework is that it does not rely on the designers parties having some kind of specific goal or incentive so that you know in your actual task if your if your dishonest party has some uh, particular goal and you want to use it uh, use your uh, uh, use your ideal function uh, use your actual task for as part of a bigger protocol the in the bigger protocol your dishonest party might have a different goal um, so your security definitions for the for the setting that you considered may not may not apply to the uh, bigger protocol. Um, okay, and in the uh, ideal functionality, uh, uh, sorry, in the composable in the composable security framework, uh, everything must be described in terms of uh, resources in the sense that we will say that we as an, an ideal functionality is also a kind of resource. And we want to say that uh, we give a protocol that converts these um, weaker resources uh, into some uh, stronger resource, which, which is this particular ideal functionality. So we are going to, uh, so when we say that we give a composable security proof, 
what we mean is that um, we give a definition for the uh, encryption with certified deletion uh, ideal functionality, and we construct it with these weaker resources. Uh, so these weaker resources are, um, so what Alice and Bob need to um, communicate, uh, uh, a temporary uh, classical authenticated channel that's also needed for QKD. Um, so, and instead of, uh, and the boxes, I guess, which are a bit hard to um, define in a DI way um, uh, in the abstract cryptography framework. Um, but yeah, we, I'll, I'll not get into that now. So, and um, uh, remember when I said earlier uh, uh, that Alice encrypts uh, a message it, um, instead of uh, with a decryption key that is later going to be revealed to Bob. Uh, what we're going to uh, do is uh, we, we're going to say Alice uses a, the protocol uses a resource that is a temporarily private randomness source. So all the randomness that Alice uses in the protocol, it's from uh, some kind of temporary source, uh, which, uh, which supplies some amount of randomness R uh, to Alice. And at some fixed time, that is going to be uh, the randomness that is used from this source is going to be uh, revealed to Bob. So yeah, that's that's how we describe it instead of saying a decryption key is later revealed. Okay. Uh, so let me describe the ideal functionality uh, that we define. Uh, so this is like for a simplified case where we where we don't consider a third party. Uh, so I said uh, earlier that um, we do consider security against the third party, um, uh, you know, like in contrast to the government and Islam framework, but uh, I'm not going to describe it here. So yeah, so in the, the ideal functionality is going to be like this. It's some black box where um, Alice enters some message that she wants to uh, reveal to work. So uh, this side of uh, the, um, the black box is uh, Alice's interfaces, and uh, this side is Bob's interfaces. So everything uh, that's input here is inputs from Alice, and everything that's output here are outputs to Bob, uh, outputs to Alice. And uh, yeah, inputs on this side are inputs from Alice, uh, inputs from Bob, sorry, and uh, outputs on this side are outputs to Bob. Okay, so. Uh, so yeah, Alice enters a message that she wants to reveal to Bob at some point in the ideal functionality. Uh, and then um, Bob enters some decision of whether he wants to produce a valid, the message is supposed to be revealed at some point, but before that point, uh, Bob enters some decision of whether uh, he wants to read the uh, ciphertext or not. So in the real protocol, after this message is entered, uh, Bob is going to be receiving some kind of ciphertext, but we don't consider the ciphertext uh, uh, in the ideal functionality itself. Okay, but uh, Bob is going to uh, reveal a decision, uh, enter a decision into the ideal functionality regardless of whether he wants to learn the message or not. So instead of um, saying uh, whether Bob wants to read the ciphertext, we're just going to say Bob, uh, whether Bob wants to learn the message because um, we don't explicitly consider a ciphertext in the ideal functionality. Uh, okay, so Bob is going to enter a decision of whether he, he's going to learn the message or not. And this uh, decision is going to be uh, what passed to Alice. I mean, it's just going to be transmitted to Alice. Uh, so, and yeah, if Bob has decided to um, learn the message, then uh, he's going to learn the message and Alice can't stop him. But if he has to, uh, decided not to learn the message, uh, then he's going to learn some uh, dummy. I mean, regardless of what the actual message Alice learned instead, he's going to learn some dummy uh, all zero string. Okay. Uh, and the point is that if Bob decides that uh, he does want to learn the message, or I mean, whether or not uh, Bob wants wants to learn the message or not learn the message, Alice can um, know his decision. Okay, um, and our composable security proof is going to go something like this. Uh, so we have this ideal functionality, but in our actual protocol, it's it's something uh, way messier. There's potentially lots of communication 
back and forth communication between Alice and Bob, and at the end, R is revealed to Bob. Uh, so in the abstract cryptography framework, you want to show something like uh, to uh, if you consider only um, the honest inputs and outputs on Alice's side of the real protocol, because Alice is the honest party, we can do this. Um, so this real protocol with only the honest stuff on Alice's side um, is indistinguishable from uh, a simulator acting on the dishonest party warp side uh, on, um, in, in the ideal protocol. Uh, so this means that uh, the simulator um, has to uh, basically uh, be able to simulate the, the real protocol in, in some way. Um, in the real protocol, uh, the, the uh, Bob receives uh, some uh, ciphertext uh, in, and in the ideal functionality, uh, Bob doesn't. So um, <clears throat> the point is that Bob needs to be able to ciphertext needs to be um, you know, uh, concealed from Bob such that um, the simulator is able to um, simulate the, 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 the distribution of the ciphertext or the quantum state corresponding to the actual ciphertext. Uh, even if in the, in the ideal, from the ideal functionality, the simulator does not um, receive the ciphertext. And um, the, the, this is done sort of similarly to the composable security proof for PKD. I'm not going to go into much detail. So because in the ideal functionality, the simulator does not receive the actual ciphertext, um, it's going to um, simulate the real protocol by uh, encrypting a dumb message, say zero to the n. Uh, and at the end, when uh, when uh, Bob when the message is potentially revealed to uh, revealed to Bob. Uh, the simulator needs to use the message in order to um, modify the, the randomness that was going to be revealed to them in the real protocol. Uh, so in order to do this before the randomness was received, uh, revealed to Bob, the, the, the quantum states on his side in the real protocol need to be completely indistinguishable uh, in, the, in the actual message and the dummy message cases. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I didn't go into much uh, detail about the composable security proof. Uh, but yeah, there are some other cases to be considered, for example, uh, security against the eavesdropper. Uh, another thing that we sort of <clears throat> understood from doing the composable security proof is that uh, the amount of um, temporarily um, private uh, randomness that we need in order to do such a protocol uh, is uh, at least equal, I mean, at least equal to the size of the message. Um, and uh, in fact, this is true for our protocol and uh, the broadband and Islam protocol as well. Uh, and uh, a sort of uh, really, uh, task that is uh, related to uh, Certified encryption with certified deletion is uh, this thing that was considered by some other people whose names are forgotten. Uh, so they considered this task of tamper evidence storage, and there they proved that the amount of uh, temporarily private resource uh, randomness or some equivalent resource that you use uh, needs to, indeed needs to be um, as as large as the message itself. Um, Another thing that we sort of discovered is that uh, for if you want to consider some sort of modification of uh, this task where um, Alice, Alice can also potentially be dishonest and you want Alice to also commit to a message, that is uh, kind of not possible um, because, because here we show that we can modify the message um, Later at any point from the actual message to the from the dummy message to the actual message, uh, Alice cannot actually commit to a message in this protocol. As in Bob cannot force Alice to commit to a message. Okay, so in summary, 
we proved the new parallel reputation theorem and um, parallel security seems important here because um, in the device independent <clears throat> settings for uh, QKDA, et cetera, we, we can consider potentially um, sequential settings because we have two um, honest parties, Alice and Bob, and they can both honestly enter the input sequentially as we need them to. But um, here we have only one honest party and Bob is potentially a dishonest party. So we cannot trust him to um, enter input sequentially and we cannot use um, sequential proof techniques, uh, sequential DI proof techniques like entropy accumulation theorem and so on. Uh, yeah, and we provided uh, modified security arguments uh, compared to government and Islam. So we provided security against the leech dropper and um, our security definitions were also composable. We showed that that's achievable. Uh, so for future prospects, so potentially uh, one could try to come up with uh, other applications for uh, this sort of tool on parallel repetition theorem. We can try to combine, so since we have a composable security definition already, we can try to combine the ECD protocol with other protocols, for example, um, right now we don't we, we don't know if Bob can actually do anything useful with the ciphertext. We could try to combine it with some sort of uh, homomorphic encryption scheme or something so that maybe Alice um, wants Bob to do some sort of computation on on the ciphertext and then delete the ciphertext. Uh, we can sort of try to give a protocol for some sort of scenario like that. Or um, yeah, another. Uh, uh, a possible future direction is uh, so. This is a, a protocol that's based on this uh, un uh, unclonability property of quantum states, and that uh, you know this sort of certified deletion task is obviously not possible for uh, classical ciphertexts because those can always be copied. Uh, but uh, because quantum states have this property of unclonability. Uh, we can do this if we use quantum ciphertext. So there are other tasks based on unclonability, such as I guess quantum copy protection and so on. And yeah, it could be interesting to see if those can also be achieved in a DIU. Okay, yeah, that's it. I'm done. Uh, are there any questions to Srijita? Yeah, maybe if not, uh, let us thank Trijita and uh, um, yeah, and end the call. Thank you, Trijita. Thank you.